I will not rein you in if you meander for the record. And I think you're our first repeat guest that does not work at Guru. So man, that's that's pretty solid ground to be on, Mr. Morley. Appreciate you joining me. Um, and, and what we're going to do here. Yeah, brother. Sorry. I didn't mean to talk over you. What, what we're going to do is really have a conversation the same way you and I would have it. If we went out and got lunch today and I said to you, Matt, one of the ways that we're considering growing in 2022 is by acquiring some other payroll companies. Can you tell me about your experience there? Can you, you know, share what some of the pitfalls might be, what the process might look like, what things to look out for? Is it a good idea, bad idea? And let, let's just have a conversation about it. And, and is this a good growth strategy? So let's start right there. I'm coming to you today, Matt. I'm saying, Matt, we're thinking about acquiring some other payroll companies uh, around the country to, to grow our business. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I think like the first question to answer is, should we grow that way or should we grow through organic growth? In other words, like, should we use our cash flow to reinvest in the business and grow organically or should we acquire another firm which could tie up cash flow anywhere from, you know, three to 10 years, um, some portion of cash flow for, for three to 10 years? Uh, go ahead. No, that's interesting. And even just as you start there and you think about deploying capital and you say, okay, hey, if I'm going to buy a book of business for half a million dollars and, you know, I'm going to get that, uh, you know, whatever that annual re recurring revenue is from that book of business, whatever percentage stays versus if I were to deploy a half a million dollars in marketing or sales, mm -hmm. how would my return be on that? So that's a good first thought. What, what are your general thoughts on that right out of the gate? Well, let's move on to the second assumption. Let's assume for now that the acquisition goes well, that it's successful and that you're able to integrate the other company and run it um, as or more profitably than the previous owner. So just, so that, I mean, that's really, I don't know if we need to go there right now, but that's really the biggest, if, if you were to say, should we do, should we acquire or not? then I would say you can make it work financially. Um, where we've seen the hiccups is you, you, you know, redline it on the financing based on, you know, rose colored glass glasses and assumptions. And then you end up, even if, you know, you don't give yourself much of a margin of safety at all. And I think mm -hmm. maybe that's something to factor in here is if you're going to acquire another company, you know, there's a reason buyer, like, let's take the sellers, put ourselves in the seller's shoes for a minute. When we know going into a negotiation that uh, the buyer is going to want to buy your company for the lowest amount possible that, that you would agree to. That is because they're trying to build in a margin of safety. I think we're in an environment right now where we just see these crazy valuations coming out and investors paying more than we could possibly imagine for companies. Um, but where that's going to run into problem, they're going to run into problems later on when they don't have any margin to make that, to make that acquisition work. Mm -hmm. So we're big proponents of figure out what you can pay and figure out what you should pay. And what you can pay is what the absolute most you can afford. And what you should pay is, you know, 100% of the time less than that. Um, so really taking it back to that marketing question, let's think about it that way. You, you probably, if you're not already, you could be calculating your customer acquisition, acquisition cost. It's a great analogy for buying another business, especially in the payroll industry. Is your customer acquisition cost higher or lower through an acquisition than through, you know, pay per click? kind of things. Um, I don't know what your sense is on that, but I think that may be a good way to frame it because those are really, when it comes down to it, your two choices for growing, growing your, uh, your book of business. Yeah, I guess it brings to mind. So would ADP only have an acquisition strategy if that were a lower cost to acquire customers instead of having the tens of thousands of foot, foot soldiers that they put out on the street um, instead of only acquiring 
local and regional players. Uh, but also at that scale, you know, unrealistic that you could acquire the level of uh, small regional and local payroll providers that would keep them growing at the level that they've committed to the street. So probably not a great analogy, but definitely something to, to chew on there. So when I think about this, it, you know, it's interesting because that, that perspective right from the start of saying, okay, hey, look, if I'm going to deploy, I'll use that half a million dollar number. If I'm going to deploy half a million dollars for a book of business, let's, let's figure out, I mean, that's probably going to be, you know, about a half a million dollars a year in annual revenue because it's probably a one-to-one -one multiplier for a, a, a one that size, maybe 2x max. Like you said, right now, people are probably paying two to three x for a book that size because things are crazy right now. Um, which, you know, average deal size will say is 2,500 per year. So that's 200 clients for your average little uh, payroll book of business. So I acquire 200 clients. 10% uh, attrition year over year. So I'm losing, uh, uh, you know, even the best of us have 90% client retention. I'm going to lose 10% of that business year over year and it's going to trail off even though I paid for it. Um, and then also, so I got to compare that versus going out of marketing and finding new clients. Let me ask you a, a kind of unrelated but related question. How many, how many deals have you actually sat in on from either the buy or sell side at this stage in your career? Matt, I wish, I really wish I had that number off the top of my head. Um, we work on different kinds of transactions, not just, I mean, the deal that we think about probably when you think I'm going to sell my business is, or I'm going to buy another business is, um, like a third party, someone that you might know, but they're not, you're not, they're not working in your business. You're not working in their business. It's just another company to buy. Um, what we work on a lot also, we work on those, but we also work on transitions internally. So management groups and um, and like next generation, like the current owner's kids and stuff. I, in all sincerity, I, I've lost count um, of, of that. It'd probably be fair to call you a deal master at this point, right? I mean, is that the term? Is that what you put on your LinkedIn header? Deal master, M&A um, expert? ninja dare i say deal guru um is, isn't there some great irony in the fact that i actually hate that word guru as it relates to like people referring to themselves as a guru and then i went ahead and named my company, that. company. Mm -hmm. yeah a little bit ironic yeah yeah well i'm a, there, I'm a there must have been a reason you were asking me about about that though i was just trying to set some context for the folks listening in so so you represent both and and you know if you if you didn't listen to the first episode with matt i highly recommend you check it out because we do get into his background a little bit there but but matt you know helps both companies that are you know selling or buying for lack of better uh, you know just to simplify things and and how they structure the deal and the strategy that they're going to have whether they're planning on selling in three to five years or it's time to go right now uh, they help them prepare for that and, and vice versa on the folks that are making acquisitions. So, all right. So, so let's say you can't talk me out of um, the acquisition model and I'm going to, it's just like the house I'm building right now. I'm going to ignore all of the headwinds of the market and just go straight into a huge life decision anyway. Um, as you can tell from everything I'm saying so far, I make great decisions, very well thought out. Um, and so I want to go out and acquire how do I know and how do I, well, let's start with how do I find deals, right? So if I'm somebody who's out and I'm just looking for companies to acquire, I mean, what do you see when folks are, are out and they're trying to find deals? Because uh, obviously people aren't, you know, listing a payroll company on biz buy sell or whatever the posting sites are. Where, where do I go and find deals? Hmm. You have a lot of, you have a lot of avenues to go and do that. You know, one is biz buy sell and it's a lot like, I know, Matt, you just said it. I think in general, you're exactly right. There's hardly anything worth worth looking at on there. But it's kind of like if you do a screen on Yahoo Finance or whatever, like you're going to come up with the 10,000 or, you know, so publicly traded things you can buy and you're going to start narrowing it down to your criterion. So I think it if you're just starting out and you want to get a sense of what the market is like, at least go search biz buy sell and see what's going on in that lower, lower end of the of the market. Um, otherwise you can go the route of soliciting of, of a investment bankers or business brokers kind of searching for you. And I'll just put, 
put us in the shoes of the buyer and not worry about selling right now. Even brokers and investment bankers will be on the lookout for things that you say you might want to buy. Um, the other way that we've seen is so much more successful is it's somebody that you know or somebody you admire or somebody you just in your industry, you're not going to know unless you ask. Mm. And it's funny the times when either we're representing or working with a uh, potential seller or a potential buyer and either of them might think, well, there's no way that, you know, they would ever do that. And then it, you just ask the question, you'd be surprised about the answer. Um, go ahead. What do you think is the best way to ask that question? It's funny you say that just because I talked to somebody recently who they were like, yeah, we've acquired two other payroll companies in the last two years. And I was like, wow, how did you find those? And he, he was like, it just happened to be conversational where, you know, I mentioned to them, Hey, if you guys are ever looking to, to move on, let us know we're in acquisition mode. And it was just that simple. It was, Hey, as a matter of fact, you know, we are interested and in, and we like you guys and we'd love to, you know, we have a trust level that already exists because of a pre-existing relationship. So and is it that simple in how you phrase it? Are you a little bit more direct? Like, what's your, what are your thoughts there? I think that if it's, if you've already got a relationship with that person, even if it's just a, you know, we met at a conference three years ago, I think I would, I would trust your gut. If it's a person who is direct, I mean, chances are they're not thinking about it, you know, like, so you asking them, might be the first time they think about it. So if they're a really direct person, then you could probably be direct with them. If they're kind of more introverted or whatever. And Matt, you know this, I'm not a psychologist, psychiatrist, counselor, anything like that. I'm just saying based on my experience, when someone hears that, if if they're kind of a, a very direct person, they'll answer you directly, yes or no more introverted person, you might want to plant some seeds before you try and harvest that, uh, that crop. Um, just over time, get them thinking. And it's really on that. And this may work for the direct folks too. to ask them what their plans are after they exit their business. Mm. I like that. I mean, you, you, you make them start thinking about what does life after business look like? I'm laughing because I actually reached out to a local guy here once. I don't know what gave me the idea that maybe they were looking to exit or maybe I just started getting FOMO of, you know, they're definitely not young guys and they are, you know, I remember back when I was at ADP, they were always somebody that the ADP folks were keeping on their tickler list of like, Hey, you know, they got two, three, 400 accounts, whatever it is. Like we want to make sure that if they go, we're, we're waiting right there. And I was like, Oh man, you know, that would, that would crush me if these guys ended up selling and they went to ADP and then ADP picks up three, 400 more accounts in my space. Like that'd be terrible. So I just yeah. floated it out to the guy, I think over LinkedIn or email and he got very defensive and was not really, <laughs> he, uh, it opened up a conversation though that we haven't had. And, and, you know, when we first started, I reached out to all the local guys and I was just trying to make, a, you know, Hey, look, my model is not going to be to take business from you. And, and I hope that it's the same from your side you know, our model is to take, but, you know, there's, there's two companies that represent, you know, nearly 2 million small businesses that we can all feed our families off of if we can, you know, either prevent them from getting deals or take deals from them. And I'm perfectly comfortable with that. And, you know, he was like the only one that didn't respond to those inquiries to sit down and have lunch or coffee or whatever. So it's been kind of fair game ever since. And then that, that might have been what made that not such a great angle to then also ask to buy them. Um, but if you're listening to this, you know who you are, and I still want to be there for you should you ever retire. I love you very deeply. All right. Nice so, recovery. Nice recovery. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, all right. So once again, I'm 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 going to ignore the market. I'm going to pay top dollar. Um, how do I, all right. So I'm looking for deals conversation. I, I think that is also the thing too, is not being scared to like raise your hand and let people know we've tried some of the signaling in the past. We haven't had a lot of deal flow from it, but just making sure like I'm connected to a ton of bureau owners, raising my hand up of, Hey, you know, we're acquiring companies. If you guys are trying to get out, 
Um, any other thoughts on ways of, of kind of smoking some folks out of their caves as it relates to possible acquisition targets? I, I think I'll double down on build, if you're building a relationship with them, continue to ask and, and, and if you, I mean, really, if you can genuinely want to understand what their objectives are for, you know, what's their timeline? What do they want out of an exit? Um, also qualify them. That's a big part of buying is not just qualifying the business, but qualifying the seller. Mm. Because if you've been through the deal process before, this won't surprise you, but a lot more deals get started than are successfully completed. Mm. A lot. And, and anything really can throw it off the rails. It's not really about, I, I don't think I've ever been part of something where somebody said, where, where somebody got upset because of a negotiation stance and they were shouting and yelling. I, I haven't really seen that. Interestingly, it, it more falls apart um, in the process of documenting everything because you're going mm-hmm. through, think about it almost like a reverse prenup. I mean, not a divorce, but like you're you're getting into this arrangement with someone else and it's it's got all these stipulations in there about what happens if then all these different conditions you've got a cert or the seller has to certify that to their knowledge, you know, dot, 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 hundreds of little sentences about that. So it's a process. Um just full of opportunities uh, to fail. Mm. Kind of our job in that is to, is if, if it is what our client wants is to keep it together and find some way to keep it together. Um, But yeah, did I, did I answer your question? I don't remember what my question was. No, that's great. So the, um, so it's interesting. Let's, let's talk about the different kinds of acquisitions from, the perspective of our industry specifically. And and I know that there's some more technical language for this. Most acquisitions are people want to buy your book of business, right? Like let's go back to the 800 pound gorilla, like ADP doesn't want to buy your best practices and your software and your, you know, IP. They want your clients. They're going to put them into the machine. I mean, quite frankly, they don't even care if you're profitable because they're going to put it into the machine and they're going to squeeze it out the other side. They're going to pay you on top line because that's all they care about. Uh, assuming, I mean, they're going to put it into the formula and say, okay, are they paying our market rate? Can we get, can we get more? Can, you know, is it going to be too, too deeply discounted? And then if so, our multipliers are going to vary based on that. And it is interesting because that, that's sort of the conundrum for all of us, right? Is like, they're going to pay the highest multiplier. Like I was just pulling up some, some payroll companies that have sold over here. just happened to stumble across view with a quick Google search. Like, you know, this one was listed. They had sales in 2019 of 600,000 and they were asking 600,000, but they it looks like they got a big tax and accounting side of this, which does not play as well. No, it does not give any indication of what percentage of revenue is from tax and accounting versus payroll. Um, but it sold, you know, another one was listed at 185 that had 150 K in revenue. And so, you know, when you're, when you're under a million, that's definitely a higher risk margin for them. And they're going to not quite give you this high of a multiplier. Um, and I know the expectation is they're going to keep 90% of that business or the hope, right. Is that they're going to keep 90% of it during the transition, because if they buy the book of business, then they know that basically that client has to sign with them after the acqu- you know, it's not really an acquisition. What is that? What does that call? Is that an asset sale? Yeah, that'd be an asset purchase. I was just about to say, you know, we've, we've noticed a big uptick in stock purchases. Um, and, and not like we, not like it's a market trend, but just in our own client base, we've noticed a lot more, um, stock purchases and sales versus asset purchases and sales. And Mm -hmm. and a lot of it comes down to what you're saying, which is you don't have to repaper anybody if, you know, if you buy the stock in in a lot of cases. Um, Some contracts have transferability built into them, which is something to really consider if you're thinking of selling anytime ever, um, is make sure there's a clause that says if somebody wants to come and buy your business, they don't have to repaper all of your accounts. They can just trans. You can just transfer them over. 
Um, I don't know what the regulatory landscape is for for payroll services or if that's um, if that's even possible to do without repapering, but it would remove. I mean, talk about like trying to make an acquisition successful. I think that would be a big one is like, how do you reduce the com- the complexity and the friction during the three to six months that you're that you're transitioning, you know, from their business to yours? And I think we covered a good bit of that in the last episode where we talked about how to drive value up. I, I don't know that we touched on that particularly, that aspect of transferability of contract, but definitely a big one. And even we saw it recently. I mean, we had to transfer our contracts from Guru and EOG were two separate entities and we had to migrate them to one entity. And, you know, we, we thankfully had that transferability in the contracts and didn't have to go through and repaper everybody. So, um, right. It's just that I was going to ask you what that term repaper meant for clarification for everyone. And then you said it enough times with enough context that I, I think that we can just, I'm adding that to my vernacular moving forward. I'm going to repaper all kinds of stuff. It's going to be dope. All right. So, so for us, so who is a good, I don't, I don't know what the word I'm looking for here, but, but prospect for acquiring companies as a growth strategy. Like when does it make sense for a business to say, all right, acquisitions are a great model for us. And that's a super broad, vague question. I understand that. But like, what are some of the things you look for and say, okay, hey, Matt, here's, here are some boxes you check or don't check that make you set up well to acquire and consume other, other companies into yours? Well, that is, that is a general and broad question. I will try to answer it, but I, it's so case by case. Um, it is so case by case. It really depends on who you're going after. I think one of the, let's look at a different kind of example. Like we, we call them roll-ups, but these, It can be regional or national consolidators. ADP, to go back to that example, they're like a giant. I mean, they're they're more than just a consolidator. They're a market leader. But usually in in industries that have a decent number of companies operating regionally and nationally, there will start to be uh, or develop groups that are specifically there to roll up, you know, uh, companies within an industry. They are a lot, they are kind of in between, like you said, ADP will just go and buy a business and, you know, let's say they just fire everybody and use their own staff to service those accounts and they're done. These regional firms understand they still need the owner in place, um, at least for a little bit. And a lot of them don't even pay cash. They'll just roll you into the larger group's equity. So you just exchange your equity for their equity. Um, but they're kind of in between in that, like if ADP's funnel is like this wide and now it's, it's outside of my camera view, like if their funnels this wide, the regional guys firms are probably this wide. If you're a single firm and you've never made any acquisitions before your funnel probably needs to be like this. Hmm. Cause so much of it comes down to, can, can you work with the founder? Is the founder interested in transitioning it to you and, and making sure that you get the value that you're paying for? Um, do you Are they prepared to exit? In other words, you can get into it and they'll realize, oh, shoot, you're going to pay me about three times what I usually take home every year. And that's, I mean, three years. I, hopefully I'm going to live more than three years. Um, oh, it almost sounds like we've gone down that road before, Matt. Man. You said it, but I mean, I've, I've seen it, you know, many, many times where you, they've got to have planning in place or they've got to have some kind of idea of like, here's what I want. Here's what I need. Um, because it, it's similar to sales in this way. You want to get to an answer quicker because mm-hmm. if you waste your time evaluating an acquisition and trying to make it work when you know that it really won't. I mean, that is a huge waste of time. Um, and, and you know, you, you miss the customer part of the customer acquisition cost formula. You just end up with acquisition costs. <laughs> um, so qualifying up front, knowing this is the type of company that you want to own, they have the type of clients you want to work with, and they have the type of owner that you want 
to work with on the transition. I mean, those are big, those are really difficult things to find on their own and finding them all at once. Um, if you do find that, that's where I'd say, even if you don't have an acquisition strategy, consider acquiring that company. On the other side of it, on your own company, I think there's times where if you have a lot of excess capacity and, and a lot of smaller services firms have this issue where like it's a chicken and the egg, like you can't add another person without also adding a ton more revenue until, you know, adding one more person doesn't mean adding, you know, increasing your total team by 20%. Mm. If adding one person increases your team by 1%, then I think it's a little bit different of a, of a thing. But I'd just say if, if you have, if you've added people and it's, you're not filling out your, your, um, like you're not growing the revenue to, to meet that extra capacity. Acquisition is one way to do that. I would not say it's a good reason to start um, if you weren't already thinking about it, but it is a good thing to think about is how much more could we be doing? And if it would take you five years to grow that level of business organically, <clears throat> but you can do it all today <clears throat> through an acquisition, it's definitely something to consider. That's really interesting. A uh, couple of things you touched on there. The, I always call it when you're small business, it's like that stair step, right? Where it's always, we're, we're never at the right point when you come to staffing, you know, for the first 20 hires, I would, I would say until somebody represents, you know, less than 5% of the business. I like the way you put that of like, okay, Hey, if they're going to be 10% of your company, you know, that that's going to require what 30% of your revenue to account for that, you know, depending on what your, your, um, what your target uh, annualized revenue is per FTE. And so, yeah, very, very interesting way to look at that. Now, I want to talk about how to finance the deals. And I want to go back to just for some context, I kind of gave what, you know, might come across as like an inside joke or something there a couple of minutes ago. But Matt and I looked at a deal a couple of years back, um, you know, looked tremendous for, for really for both parties. I mean, it was kind of a win-win. It was proposed to us in a way that was a win for the owner. Um, it was a win for us. Uh, however, there were just some glaring issues that were seemingly obvious. And Matt kind of alluded to it where it was like, hey, this isn't retirement type money for this individual, but yet they don't really want to go take a second bite at the apple afterwards. And so the timing was the big thing. And so if they're not ready, if it's not enough to retire, they don't have the next phase lined up. Like those are some simple things you can vet out before to Matt's point, you go and spend money on lawyers and consultants and CPAs to analyze whether or not it's a good deal. Like sometimes you just got to be more, I guess, aggressive in your question asking or, or, or have a little bit more direct line of questioning. We had a lot of conversations. So I don't know that that was the issue. I think it's just, um, you know, like you said, sun will reach every component of the deal by the time the day sets. And so that that's something to to keep in mind when you're going through these is that they're not they're not going to leave any stone unturned from their side. And neither are you by the time this thing is over. Right. All right. So here's my proposed strategy if I were to go and acquire uh, apparel companies in 2022. And so I want you to tell me how good or bad the strategy is at a high level. So, so for us, we offer PEO and ASO services. So on average, these are services that go more from the 50 to a hundred dollars per employee per month, um, versus the traditional payroll model, which is, you know, probably averaging like 10 bucks per employee per month. Uh, so the strategy would be to say, Hey, we want to go out and acquire multiple small payroll books of business that are on the same software as us. So thereby trying to reduce as much of the friction as possible in the transition, remove the owner from the equation as quickly as possible. Uh, once the, the accounts are trans the transitioned over to us, we're not too concerned about an earn out. We're more concerned about, um, you know, obviously capturing as much of the business as possible, but then just allowing them to move on with their lives or, you know, grow the other side of their business. Most of these folks probably going to be accountants or, you know, folks that offer payroll, but it's not their core business. They got 20, 30 accounts, 40, 50, a hundred accounts, whatever it is, but it's more of a distraction than a, um, than a core component of their business. 
And then our, obviously we want to then land and expand, right? And so we want to uh, try to, to land these accounts, certainly retain them as long as possible on whatever solutions they're on, but then upsell them on our suite of services, whether that be, you know, HR software, we've got our HR platform we built out, we've got our HR services, we've got benefits, all, all those fun things. And so, you know, it, it's a speed to market issue is what it solves, right? So I can't go out and book 50 accounts next quarter uh, without h- hiring, you know, multiple sales reps and training them and dealing with all the overhead that relates to that. So, so that's the, the, the thought process behind it. However, you know, the big snag is financing. So I'm not sitting on millions of dollars. Uh, so I'd like to, to come back to you. I think that's a big component of all this is how you finance these deals and, and what are some of the ways that people, you know, if, if they're, they're doing it with debt if they're doing it with you know is the owner financing it and and getting some sort of earn out over time the financing or is it just hey if you don't have the cash on hand like for the first one you shouldn't be shouldn't be playing with this at all so first let's address the strategy poke holes in that where can that go haywire on me what's the what would your biggest concern be based on the the high level bullets i gave you there i mean i i don't really have any concerns i'd like to see how that would play out i i might keep the owners on a little bit longer or at least have a consulting agreement where you can bring them in if you need to um at least through the retention period and then correct me if i'm wrong but usually in your industry there's some component of a hold back for retention so if there's a retention goal of like 70 percent, or if there's a retention goal of 90 percent and they and you only reach 70 on their book then they might lose out on some portion of the deal that was held back to cover retention yeah and that can be as brief as 90 days um sometimes longer okay well that i mean to me that's what i would i would really make sure of um just keeping them available maybe not around but available Hmm. um also, it depends on if you're going to keep their employees on, or are you going to keep their location? Um, just a lot of moving parts to consider. No. No, not going to keep their employees? <laughs> I, unless, keep they're, their unless they're awesome. Um, so, yes, obviously great opportunities to acquire talent. However, you know, from my experience of kicking around a few of these, it's been more of a, hey, that's going to come with its own set of challenges that are, how do we integrate these people into our culture and our way of doing business, you know, and get them out of the, hey, this is how we do things mentality. And sometimes that becomes more of a challenge than it's worth. And, and now anecdotally, I don't have that experience with the owners, but however, you know, when we've gone down this path in the past, obviously I've sought a lot of great counsel and, and most folks are like, yeah, you cannot keep the owner around for too long after the fact, because it just becomes too many chiefs kind of a thing. And they, Oh yeah, uh, definitely yeah. the owner, you got to get them out sooner than later. But I think maybe our definition of sooner is different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah and, and I think that's part of, I'm, I don't know enough about, right. Is how soon, you know, there's that two sides of the coin, right. You sell your business, nobody wants the two year earn out, but it's also part of the deal, right? Is just most times, you know, when it comes time to sell, they're not going to be able to just pick up all the pieces of your business and move it forward. You know, if with some of these smaller ones, 20, 30, 40, 50 accounts that are doing payroll only, you know, might be a little bit easier, but yeah, still obviously need that, that transfer of knowledge. What about fundraising or what about uh, financing that strategy? Um, okay. So let's talk about, well, I'm, I'm asking you if you give me some money, I think, do you have some money? I'm just trying to think about how, how am I going to get all those Bitcoins out of cold storage? That's what I'm, <laughs> no, Dude, I, you should put your money in Ethereum. <laughs> yeah. Uh, unfortunately I do not have, uh, my own merchant bank, but so let's say, let's keep it like companies that are maybe 5 million in revenue or below or 5 million in value and below like the, the best tool there is, uh, you know, from my, from my perspective <clears throat> is the SBA seven, a loan program. Um, it's worked like it is a bear to get through, but if you've taken anybody through, if you've been through it, 
once or taken anybody through it once, then it becomes a lot more clear, like why they might be asking for the same thing three or four times. And you just have to have it all in one place so you can get it to them when they ask for it. Uh, but, but I, and I think some people are concerned about like, you know, privacy or, or government interference in their business with, with SBA 7A. I don't, I can't address that. I haven't really seen it hurt anybody, but if you feel that way, this might not be the option for you, but the benefits are it, even if you could get a loan from a bank based on the cash flow of the other business that um, was enough, you still are probably going to have like maybe max like five to seven year amortization with the SBA 7A program. You can have amortization of 10 years if it's just a business and it can be, I think up to like 30 years, if there's real estate up to 15 years with no prepayment penalty, hmm. which is, which is actually a big, a big deal right now because the banks can't get interest. So they've kind of been whammying, whammying people with uh, prepayment penalties because not many people look for those. So that's something to look out for. It's not what we're talking about here, but if you're going to get a loan, Look and see if there's a prepayment penalty. You can usually negotiate it out of the loan. Um, but <clears throat> no prepayment penalty for less than 15 years maturity, a 10 year maturity, which means your cash flow. <clears throat> it's just it's a lot less. Uh, it gives you more margin of safety to, mm. to if something goes wrong. If you can have half the debt service that you would have had with a five year loan because you now have a 10 year loan to me in the beginning stages of of acquiring and, and implementing or, or running another business in addition to yours, the margin of safety is worth the cost of the interest that you would pay over the additional five years, especially at the rates today. Mm. One of the issues with the SBA loans is that they have variable rates, which means you've got to be ready for a little bit of fluctuation in your, in your debt service. Um, but still, I think it's, it's the best deal out there right now. So what about if I start stacking? So let's say I make that first acquisition and the second one comes six months later because I've been planting so many seeds. Can I go, is the SBA, how friendly are they to me coming back and saying, yep, I need another million dollars right now because I just found another deal and here's, here are the logistics on this one. Yep. You can do that. You can have multiple SBA loans. Uh, I don't know what the limit is. I'm sure there is one. Um, I think it'd be really hard to hit it though. I'm curious about this because obviously OPM is the play, right? We want to do this with other people's money because, yeah, I mean, yeah, if you're listening to this and you're sitting on just stacks of cash to go out and make multiple acquisitions, that's dope. You should, you know, come and make us an offer. We can't refuse. But most of us are going to need to to leverage other people's money to to really build out a, a good acquisition strategy. So what about this? I mean, is there are there cases of obviously it's much more you know, glamorous and popular now to raise an investment round in our industry that is only done, and I don't want to say only, but mostly done if you're building a tech stack and you have, you know, a hyper aggressive strategy, which is, uh, you know, a one other path. That's a whole other episode altogether. But do you think that there's the opportunity to go out and pitch investors on, hey, here's my strategy. I'm going to go out and acquire, you know, X number of payroll units over the next 24 months from these types of targets. And, you know, here's what the ROI is on that. And then it's part of this five-year strategy where we're going to acquire, we're going to blow this thing up as much as we can, and then we're going to sell it off. Uh, because we know that once we're over this revenue marker, our multiplier goes up. And so therefore, it's going to create that liquidity event that you need as an investor. Um, is that a strategy that you think could play? Maybe. Uh, if you're meeting with the right group of, <clears throat> of potential investors, but I would take it back to, you know, like the finance, the evaluation of what would be better? You know, I'm going to say this and I'll qualify it with, there's probably cases where this is not the case, but like 99% of the time debt is cheaper than equity. Hmm. And, and it's especially something that younger or smaller companies, uh, it's difficult to envision that because the only equity you might've had so far is your own. And 
if I'm a founder, it feels a lot cheaper for me to put more cash into my business than to borrow more cash from a bank. But in reality, it is still cheaper 99% of the time from, from a bank. It's the same with, with outside equity. Um, even the best terms, you're still giving up a piece of something that could have been all yours. And we would prefer to, to consider not doing that before we get there. Does that make sense? No. Okay. So if we don't, it's okay. I, I know. I like it makes sense in my head, but when it came out, I was this like, is the last part. You lost me a little bit. So we don't want. So if we know that equity is ninety nine percent of the time is going to be more expensive than debt, then we want to try it. We want to exhaust all the debt options first. Mm. And there's so many debt options on the way to equity. If you don't find one that works it's probably the market telling you that your strategy is not going to work and you can choose to listen or not. But I think that's part of why when you take that leap from the debt to the equity, equity investors want more of the pie or preference or whatever they get um, because they recognize like you probably exhausted all your other options before you came to talk to this, you know, whoever it happens to be. Well, and that that makes sense from a logical perspective because the only argument for going the equity route would be less risk to you as an individual, right? Because you're not having to put second mortgages on your house and, you know, like it, it, that that's not, you know, if it all blows up and goes to zero when you had, you know, uh, $2 million in, in the equity investment, then, you know, that was just a bad bet by the investors. Whereas if it all goes to zero with $2 million in debt-based investment, then you're, or debt-based debt, excuse me, then you're, you know, you owe $2 million. So, <laughs> so very different outcome, uh, which yes, is, is probably worth the, the tax, if you will, of taking the equity round. Uh, but if, to your point, if you've got a clear strategy, these are, you know, I listened to an interview the other day with a guy who founded 1-800-GOT-JUNK. Really fascinating guy. I, I don't remember his name off the top of my head, but it was a great interview and I definitely recommend people check it out. But it was like, they started consuming all these other businesses because they were just like, look, all we're doing is we've got proven processes that we're going to implement across really boring industries that are going to help to, you know, once again, squeeze that dollar from the top line to the bottom line and delight customers in a way they're not used to, which is the opportunity that we have, quite frankly, when you think about there's 16,000 people or companies in America that process payroll, uh, you know, 15,000 of them are probably doing it pretty poorly. And so, you know, there's, there's an opportunity for the remaining thousand to actually, you know, delight people in a way that they're not used to and make it something that's modern and elegant and fun and, and, and kind of add some, uh, a unique twist to something that's pretty boring. So, um, all right. So well, what do you think about my strategy, Matt? I mean, you think we should plow forward with this? I mean, I'll give you my favorite answer. It depends. Uh, <laughs> uh, you kill me. Uh, all you consultants come on with the it depends answers, man. Come on. You sound like an HR guy. That's what I have to tell our clients all the time too. It's like, uh, well, you know, should we do this? Well, it depends. That's <laughs> yeah. fine. It's fine. It's an educated, it's an educated risk. I wouldn't even call it like an educated guess. Uh, you shouldn't be guessing but you are taking educated risk on um, like what kind of danger are you putting your existing business in mm. by trying to bolt another one onto it or another two or another 10. Um, there was, and also the strategy itself can get thrown off. So what if you get one acquisition in and then your funding source says, you know, your, your source of equity funding says. Well, no. I, in, in my example here, I'm going to go your first route with debt funding. I, I don't think that equity, I, 
honestly, it's just, it's too, uh, I, I'd rather take my lumps from the banks than sit here and get 500 no's from investors because they, you know, it's not sexy enough for them at the end of the day is what really is going to be the thing, right? Is it's just, well, one of the challenges that we've always seen and why we bootstrapped our own software is like the message of, Hey, we're just going to execute and we're going to master the blocking and tackling is not one that resonates with people that want to place massive bets, right? Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. And I think not right now, but I think in the future, we could get back to a point where people are valuing their capital a little bit more dearly mm -hmm. um, and, and interested in businesses that, that actually generate cash flow. Um, but I understand that. Um, so I'm going to march forward with the debt based model. Um, now let me ask you this. Let's turn this in and, we'll, and we'll, we'll wrap up here in just a minute, but let's go back to what my first option was to say, all right, so if I'm going to take a million and acquire a book of business or half a million was the first example, could I go get a loan with my business plan that says I've got, I need a half a million dollars to organically grow my book of business. And here's the the plan. What What's my likelihood of success versus uh, saying I'm going to buy this proven asset versus here's my plan to grow. I'm going to go hire these five salespeople and I'm going to implement this infrastructure and X, Y, Z. Like, does that, is that an option with an SBA loan? Man, I, uh, sorry, I got completely lost in your question because I was thinking about how right you are that it could be difficult. Yeah. All right. Can you ask that one more time? Because I was stuck on something else you said. That's all right. I mean, I know you've been drinking for most of the day, so I'll, 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 speak, to Friday? I don't <laughs> I'll speak slower. I mean, it's 430 in the afternoon, y'all. You got to understand Matt's into a sixth bourbon by now. So the... I'm just playing. He's, he's more of a weed guy, but so the, uh, could I go to the bank or what would my likelihood of success be uh, in let's yes. kind of, let's wrap these that's up, so right? of like half a million for an acquisition versus half a million for the business plan. That's going to reap the same results as the acquisition, but requires hiring process, et cetera. Like what's my likelihood of success on either one of those hitting as far as getting the loan in the first place. You won't, I don't think you would get a loan if you said, I need uh, $500,000 to grow my business organically over three to five years. Because if I were a bank, I would say, you, at first, that's what I was thinking. Like, that's crazy. I hadn't thought about it that way. But I think the reason the bank would say no is because you could fund it out of your own cash flow over the three to five years. The issue with an acquisition is you've got to fund it all at once. And it's either in, like for, for most businesses that are going to be under 5 million in revenue, it's either going to be funded via, you know, bank or SBA debt or seller's note. And no seller really, as that we've come across, would want to take, would want to transfer all the value of the business over to you, but still retain the majority of the risk. Like that's why sellers don't want to finance deals because they might as well just continue owning the business if they're going to have to finance the lion's share of the deal. Mm -hmm. um, but a bank will do that because all they want is interest in the return of their principal. Yeah. And I wish we could have come back to that. I know we're coming up on time of just like, you know, I know that the, the last deal we looked at, we had a nice creative way of financing with the owner that was beneficial to him and us. And honestly, I don't even remember the exact structure now, but, uh, um, it's definitely more favorable to us, to your point. Um, but, uh, certainly worked for both parties. Um, all right, well, Matt, you know, this has been, it's been something. What, uh, what would you like to leave folks with here? I mean, if you're thinking about it, if you're thinking about an acquisition or you have an opportunity, um, as soon, so I'll give you an example. I was talking to somebody yesterday who said, you know, they had gotten an NDA from a t potential buyer. So a non-disclosure agreement from a t potential acquirer. Um, and they said, Hey, do I, is there anything I need to be concerned about with this? And I just said, Hey, I'm not an attorney. 
Um, but like, and for that reason, but I can tell you there's important stuff in there. And for that reason, you should probably get with an attorney now for, to have them review that, whether you end up going through it, through with it or not. Um, I think that is the message is the sooner you can get other people involved, the better and smoother it will potentially go. You can get it to the answer quicker. So get to a yes or no quicker and then be organized in the way that you're going through actually implementing and executing the transaction. Yeah. And I'll just give a quick plug for Pendleton Street Business Advisors here because we use you guys when we were looking at that deal particularly, and it was one that didn't pan out, but it was in the first call that we had, I felt great about paying your fee. Uh, because, you know, one of the things I was looking for was somebody who could see around corners, somebody who knew what I don't know and what to say, when to say it, what not to say and who to bring in when. And it was so obvious just in the first conversation with the, the potential uh, acquisition that you guys had me covered there. And so that, that was huge. And I think to your point is if people that are out navigating these types of situations on their own are only going to lose a lot of money in the long run, whether that be from, you know, getting devalued, overpaying, you know, underpaying for, you know, buying a bad, making a bad deal. It's just, there's too many things that if this is not your specialty, it's the same thing we go through, right? Our pitch of why somebody would hire your payroll or HR company. It's the same dang thing. So like, don't, don't be a hypocrite when it comes to a much larger deal. So Thank you, Mr. Morley. We appreciate you dropping some knowledge on us today. Well, thanks for those kind words and thanks for having me again. Of course. Love you.